When do people buy products? Well, they buy products when they believe they will contribute to their psychic, physical, or mental, or social well-being. Okay, so let's see how real products were sold. Schlitz Beer advertised that its bottles were steam cleaned. Appeal to health consciousness, right? Now, all beer bottles were steam cleaned, but they didn't advertise that, and Schlitz did. Made it sound as if Schlitz was doing something unique. They're not selling the taste of the beer, notice. They're selling healthfulness. Grand Rapids, Michigan, where they produced mass manufactured furniture, advertised this factory produced furniture as traditional craftsmanship. What does it have to do with traditional craftsmanship? Nothing. But it's a way of associating a product with something that people value. Campbell's Soup, produced in Camden, New Jersey, in a giant factory, was anything but old-fashioned home cooking. It was new-fashioned industrial cooking. But people wouldn't buy anything sold that way. So you associate it with tradition, even though it's not tradition. I mean, the real appeal is obviously convenience. But that's not how you sell a product. Many advertisements tried to appropriate the prestige of science and especially tried to promise to restore health and beauty. Husbands were told by the Aetna Life Insurance Company that their wives would degenerate into humpbacked sourpusses if they didn't buy insurance. Now, the logic may not make any sense to us, but it's an appeal to certain kinds of needs and fears and anxieties. If wives overlooked puffed rice, or the prophylactic toothbrush, as it was called, their children would suffer from malnutrition and pyorrhea. Uh, a century before the phone company came up with its reach out and touch somebody's ads, uh, advertisers were already appealing to nostalgia and sentimentality as a way to get people to buy their products. More commonly, as we saw, advertisers appeal to the authority of doctors. Notice what they are not appealing to. They're not appealing to religion. They're not appealing to spiritual values. They're not appealing to traditional authority figures. Advertisements, I'm trying to suggest, were tutors to the public that helped to educate them about modernity and help to create certain internal anxieties and psychic needs that people didn't even realize that they had. They're able to exploit this. Is your child run down, frail, delicate, underdeveloped, pale, always tired, easily upset, irritable, backward in school, not himself? Don't give him Ritalin. Instead, these are the signs of malnutrition. One child in every three, rich or poor, is undernourished. The way out, Quaker oats. Again, you don't sell the oats because they taste good. You sell them because they're going to meet some much deeper need that people have. Scott Paper hired the country's leading behaviorist psychologist, a man named John B. Watson, who came up with a campaign to promote toilet paper. Remember, this is the harsh toilet paper. But the cigarette companies were faced with a much more difficult problem. And that is, smoking cigarettes was viewed as inappropriate behavior for women. And that meant that half the potential market for cigarettes was closed off. Now, they offered the job to Sigmund Freud to see if he could come up with a solution, and he turned them down. So they went to Sigmund, Sigmund Freud's nephew, a man named Edward Bernays, who just died last year. Uh, he was well over 100 when he died. And he came up with a campaign to get women to smoke. What he did is he hired debutantes, 
in New York, wealthy young women, and had them march up Fifth Avenue smoking torches of freedom. These were imitations of the suffrage marches, the women marching for the vote. Uh, women had indeed come a long way, right? Uh, remarkable. So what you have are ads inventing new kinds of diseases, associating their products with health, happiness, liberation. And what these advertisers are revealing is that those strategies work extremely effectively. That those strategies will get people to spend money on needs they didn't even know existed. Men's toiletries were sold as keys to success and barriers against embarrassment. Women were constantly reminded of the dangers of giving offense through bad breath, yellow teeth, body odor, or shabby home furnishings. In other words, advertising was making people more sensitive to all kinds of social cues around them. Many ads for household products, as we saw, showed guests in one's house evaluating the food, the furniture, even the bathroom drains. And so advertising helped create a new kind of American. Americans much more tuned to self-fulfillment, to health, to beauty. Okay, next we're going to talk about the revolution in recreation. The revolution in recreation we talked about earlier. During the 19th century, most Americans spent nothing on recreation. Boys and men found amusements in the open countryside. They hunted, they fished, they swam, they rode. Sometimes they shot at targets, but they didn't pay any money to entertain themselves. Millions of boys learned how to play baseball, but baseball was still a game played on sandlots. Attendance at professional games was pitifully small. Uh, even at the World Series in the early 20th century, attendance of 1,000 or 2,000 a game seemed like a large crowd. Organized sports such as basketball, football, wrestling, and golf, these were concentrated on college campuses. They were affectations of the rich. Ordinary people knew nothing about them. Even in cities, leisure activities were brief, casual, and non-commercial. People visited friends. They clustered on street corners. They read the penny press. They didn't spend much money on leisure. Inexpensive pleasures were everywhere in the early 20th century city. There were organ grinders, often with monkeys on their shoulders. There were street musicians. Uh, it's like going to Berkeley, California today. Uh, itinerant acrobats, baked potato vendors, soda dispensers, hot corn stands, and the like. But there wasn't our kind of commercial amusement. Throughout the 19th century, entertainment was sharply sex segregated. Men went to male only bastions of entertainment. They went to pool halls, billiard rooms, bowling alleys, shooting galleries, and gyms. Working men formed baseball teams and they formed street gangs or political gangs. People went to cigar stores and barber shops, saloons, union halls, political clubs, and especially fraternal lodges. And these were hangouts where men drank and socialized and relaxed in the company of other men. In New York City, there was a saloon on virtually every street corner. Alcohol was the major form of entertainment in the 19th century. Men wanted to forget the tedium, toil, and poverty of their lives, and alcohol seemed to wash their problems away. Uh, a man could get a free lunch with a five-cent beer, 
and enjoy the fellowship of the barkeep and the other patrons uh, at the saloon. Anyway, saloons were also places of information. You could get a job, a loan, or simply the news at a saloon where everybody knows your name, right? Uh, of course, many saloons also served as centers of gambling and as houses of prostitution as well. Now, young men often join gangs, as I said. They join militia companies. They joined voluntary fire companies, and they often went to theaters and to pool halls. But what kind of amusements particularly attracted men? And the answer will surprise you and, I suspect, even disgust you. Because what people were attracted to in the 19th century were violent entertainments, deformity, brutal entertainments. Uh, we may talk about the coarsening of our culture in the early 21st century. Political candidates tell us how crass and crude we are, but compared to the 19th century, we're refined. Among the most popular entertainments in the 19th century were traditional sports in which one animal was sicked upon another. They would attack each other and fight to the death. Bears, bulls, trained dogs, cocks, any aggressive beast would be pitted against another. People would gamble, they would drink, they'd have high spirits as they would watch these animals tear each other to pieces. The real appeal of these entertainments was sadism and open blood lust. People got pleasure in witnessing this pain. Now, of all the popular amusements, bull baiting was the most violent and bloody and the most popular. The rules were simple. You would take a bull and you would put a collar around the bull's neck and you would chain the bull with a rope to allow the bull some movement, but not much. And then you would set special fighting dogs with sharpened claws onto the bull. And then the enraged bull would try to defend itself. It would toss and shake and gore the attackers. And the dogs would slip in and clamp on the bull's lips or nostrils with their vice-like jaws. And people would bet to see if the dogs would win or whether the bull would win. And people would love to watch these events. The skill of the attackers, the tenacity of the bull, the bellows of anguish, dogs hurtling through the air with their bellies ripped open, gallons of beer, the clink of silver. What could be greater excitement in the 19th century than that? This was the kind of entertainment that ordinary Americans flocked to in huge numbers in the 19th century. Now, blood sports depended on the endurance of the animals. They were not timed. There were no three-minute rounds. They could go on literally for hours, and people would watch all the time. Now, for mill hands, or rural laborers, this was a spectacular break in the dreary routine of their work lives. But it wasn't just blood sports involving animals. Human blood sports were also popular, especially what was called rough and tumble fighting. It was a particularly popular form of entertainment. It's a little like wrestling, except it's not fixed, and there are no rules. Men would try to gouge out eyes or to rip off testicles. Uh, 
these fights would drag on for hours as a way for a man to demonstrate his manliness. Another popular form of amusement was the display of what were called at the time monstrosities. Giants, albinos, dwarfs, armless men, and the like. This is a kind of entertainment that we find even more disturbing, I think, than the blood sports. Gaping crowds of onlookers would make sports of these quote-unquote monstrosities. They would taunt and torment these creatures whose ties to humanity seem so fragile. This is a period between an era of superstition and an era of science, and people worked through ancient fears and anxieties by looking at monstrosities. Uh, so they didn't know whether these were the products of divine wrath, or of witchcraft, or punishment, or disease. They had no explanation, and they seemed to be fascinated by staring and tormenting. Terror and repugnance mixed with curiosity and continued to do so long after scientific explanation succeeded superstition. I mean, many of your parents probably remember going to circus sideshows that still had displays that were pretty similar to this. I mean, this lasted till after World War II. But of course, those entertainments were for men because the world of leisure was sharply sex segregated. If you were a married woman, your leisure activities were confined and limited. You might sit on the steps of a tenement. You might take walks in the park. You might participate in church functions. Or you might visit your relatives or friends. And that was it. There weren't a wide range of leisure activities available for women. But in the late 19th century, and especially in the early 20th century, the amount of time available for leisure expanded. And leisure, for the first time, became commercialized. That is, people began to charge money for leisure activities. And the kind of leisure activities that emerged were mixed sex, youth oriented activities. Dance halls, amusement parks, urban nightclubs, and eventually movie theaters. So a whole new kind of leisure appears. These institutions would give young people a new kind of liberation from adult supervision. Instead of courting, as it was called in the 19th century, young men and women began to date, a new word that appears just at the beginning of the 20th century. And that means that it's less formal, it's not necessarily intended for marriage, and it's taking place away from the eyes of parents. It's very different than courting. What happened in the 1890s and first years of the 20th century is that a new culture would market entertainment and would spread new values of style, fashion, romance, glamour, and mixed sex fun. And of course it would be the movies that would be the absolute uh, most important engine propelling this change. Now the first sign of change was the rise of the dance hall. There had been a small number of dance halls uh, in major cities where sailors and prostitutes would hang out. And then suddenly in the 1890s there was an explosion by 1910, there were 500 dance halls in New York City alone. And instead of appealing just to sailors and prostitutes, they appealed to young people. 
Another sign of change was the growth of the amusement park. Beaches, picnic grounds, and the like. Streetcars, subways, excursion boats would take people to these new amusement parks. The most famous was, of course, Coney Island uh, near New York. In the 19th century, Coney Island was a desolate beach. But by 1880, it became New York's leading amusement park, complete with bathhouses, restaurants, dance pavilions, open-air stages, a boardwalk, and circus sideshows. By 1900, Coney Island had truly become the nation's first modern amusement park. It had thrill rides, fun house laughs, a midway, a Ferris wheel, roller coasters, a whole assortment of mechanical rides. Ten hours of fun for ten cents was the advertising slogan, and it was a good one. And literally hundreds of thousands of people would flock just to that one park alone. And new foods, I should add, were invented to go along with this. Foods people could eat with their hands, the ice cream cone, the hot dog, and the most interesting of all, the hamburger. You would think hamburgers would be an old and sort of timeless invention, but people, for reasons that are not clear to me, did not eat ground beef. And so ground beef in a bun is really a new invention uh, of the uh, late 19th century, early 20th century. So even before the invention of the movies in the 1890s, there is this movement, this hunger for freer commercial forms of entertainment. And one of the new forms of entertainment we will call vaudeville. Vaudeville. People had gone to theaters earlier in time, mainly men and female prostitutes, and people had attended Victorian melodramas, and in those theaters the theater goers would hiss the villains and warn the heroine of oncoming danger. Audiences were not respectful in those days. They sang, they stamped their feet, vendors went through the crowd selling food and other goods. Uh, it was a very lively experience in which the audience participated. Music halls, too, attracted both sexes. Uh, some saloons created back rooms. By the 1860s, there were about 200 concert saloons in New York City. But again, these saloons catered largely to men, laborers, soldiers, sailors, and slumming gentlemen. But the roots of vaudeville performances begin in those concert saloons. You have crude jokes, bawdy comedy sketches, scantily clad singers, all entertaining the drinkers. But in the late 19th century, a number of showmen began to discover that if they attracted a higher class of audience, they could bring in larger numbers of women who would only attend, quote unquote, respectable entertainment. And so instead of emphasizing drinking, the entertainment itself became the main attraction. Women were often admitted free into these theaters in order to change the tone. Uh, and they often gave out prizes, such as coal, flower, and dress patterns, to attract a female clientele. And it worked. By the 1890s, the middle class was attending vaudeville. Lavish vaudeville palaces were constructed, and audiences were educated about how to behave properly. They were not to talk during a performance. They were not to stamp their feet during a show. They were not to throw tomatoes at the performers. They're being trained, in other words, to be a modern 
passive audience, like people who sit in classrooms. Right? Now, tickets were not cheap. Prices range from 10 cents up to a dollar. So the only people who could afford to go regularly were higher income families. But what if you could find a cheaper form of entertainment? Clearly, the market was there. The challenge now is to find a kind of entertainment that could meet these people's needs. And the answer would, of course, be the movies. Now, in vaudeville, what was particularly popular was a kind of middle class sentimentality. Songs about childhood, recollections of the old home, love of mother. But all this was combined with sexual innuendo and raucous action. So this kind of weird mixture would eventually be absorbed by movie makers. An observer noted, quote, the songs are suggestive of everything but what is proper. The choruses are full of double meanings, and the jokes have broad and unmistakable hints of things indecent. But what vaudeville demonstrated is that there was a mass audience for this kind of entertainment, if only it could be cheaper. In the 1890s, vaudeville theaters began to show movies, primitive movies, first as a novelty and later as what were called chasers. That is, you would show a movie at the very end before people were told to leave the theater. Then, around 1900, amusement parlors and penny arcades began to house moving picture peep shows known as kinetoscopes. Let me show you a room full of them. You can see what it must have been like. So along with slot machines, phonographs, muscle testing apparatuses, and fortune telling machines, you could also see a peep show. Soon the owners of amusement arcades began to close off a section in the back and then project movies on the screen charging a nickel or 10 cents for admission. And nickel madness began to spread across the nation's cities. The movies would bring a sharp change in popular amusements. For the first time, you would have huge numbers of women attending commercial amusements. At least 40% of the audience in the first decade of the 20th century was made up of women. By the 1920s, the majority of the moving going audience is women. So it's different than today when the major group who goes to movies is young males from 12 to 28. I mean, that's the biggest single part of the movie going audience, which is why movies are the way they are, right? Uh, Many middle-aged and older women began to become steady patrons of these early movie theaters. So the whole segregated pattern of recreation breaks down. Uh, now, to try to keep these places proper, they would spray perfume through the theaters. Uh, it take away the smell of the audience. Uh, now, the cheap cost of the movies was an inducement. The fact that you could take children along with you was also an attraction. The movies would develop an audience the likes the country had never seen before. Nickelodeons would achieve unprecedented popularity, but they would also come under attack. Public officials, the clergy, Reformers would all assail the theaters. They would accuse them of spreading disease, and worse yet, they would accuse them of spreading immorality. And one thing we're going to see is that the movies would quickly become a cultural battleground, which of course they still remain even today. Uh, in 1907 and 1908, 
New York City and Chicago actually closed down the movie theaters. Uh, a number of Nickelodeon owners in New York were arrested. They were charged with violating Sunday closing laws, showing indecent pictures, and imperiling the morals of youth. Movies were accused of creating public disturbances. But there was a massive public revolt. The public loved the movies and the Custodians of morality could not contain this form of public entertainment. But the movie manufacturers learned a lesson then that they would forever remember, which is when threatened with government regulation, regulate yourself. Okay? That is, if the outside world is going to impose controls, it's better to censor yourself. And so in 1909, the movie manufacturers would create the National Board of Review, which would become the leading agency reviewing motion pictures in America. And it would set up a code of conduct that would limit what could be shown in movies. What we're going to see in our class is this will happen again and again and again because these codes are never really enforced very stringently. After all, they're self-governing codes. And there's no real interest, no serious interest among movie makers to obey the dictates. But it gives people the impression, at least, that something is being done. So the National Board of Review prohibitive suggestive behavior, prohibited passionate love scenes, it prohibited close dancing, it prohibited low-cut gowns. We'll see in our class next week how little effect it had. At the same time, however, the real dream of exhibitors is not just to reach a working class audience but to find a middle-class audience. And so exhibitors begin to build the movie palaces we began our class with in central business districts. Exhibitors er labeled their theaters with exalted names. They were the Majestic, the Empire, the Grand, the Washington, the Fox, the Royal, the varsity, and on and on. And these theaters would succeed in drawing in an increasing percentage of the middle class. So, in other words, in a span of little more than a decade, American leisure patterns were totally transformed. The second revolution I promised to describe to you, we're going to talk about very briefly now, is the rise of mass communications. The rise of mass communications. Again, in a span of little more than a decade, most of the modern instruments of mass communication arose. The first was the mass circulation newspaper Often it took the form of the tabloid that's a little smaller than the modern newspaper. You have the best seller. You have the mass market magazine. And you have the national advertising campaign. The first of these modern instruments of mass communication was the urban tabloid. Uh, it was pioneered by Joseph Pulitzer, an immigrant from Eastern Europe, and by William Randolph Hearst. Uh, the Hearst organization now owns the Houston Chronicle, though it doesn't seem like much of a Hearst newspaper. Uh, tabloids would feature banner headlines, photographs, cartoons, an emphasis on crime and scandal, sports, and large ads Half the newspaper would be made up of ads. Earlier in time, newspapers had contained very, very few ads. 
Uh, entertainment was the stock in trade of these new newspapers. They were called yellow journalism. <coughs> they were printed often on yellowing paper. Uh, yellow journalists would introduce fashion pages, advice columns, sports pages, stock market pages, and the like. They would go from circulation of 20, 30, 40,000 until 1905, Pulitzer's New York World had a circulation of 2 million. I mean, this is truly astonishing. Around the same time, the first mass circulation magazines appeared. Before 1900, the most popular magazines in America were sedate journals aimed at a genteel audience with names like The Atlantic or Harper's or Scribner's. These were published by fancy book publishing companies and they were very fancy magazines. They had expensive wood etchings. They had fiction by the leading writers in the country and they had very small circulation. Their circulation was no more than about 50,000 and they were almost entirely read in the Northeast. People in other parts of the country had no interest. They were written for people with highly intellectual tastes and they embodied what was called the genteel tradition a phrase you're going to need to know. It's the idea that art and literature should reinforce morality and refine sensibility. Artists were not to portray the real. They were to portray the ideal. One editor explained in simple terms what he would not allow in his journal. And he said it was this anything that would make his wife or daughter blush. A simple standard of what would be kept out. But then in the 1890s, the first mass circulation magazines were born. These new magazines frowned upon the older kind of elitist journals. They believed that they were stale and that the new magazines were lively. The first of the mass circulation magazines was the Ladies' Home Journal, and it had a slogan, never underestimate the power of a woman, and it had a circulation by the beginning of the 20th century of 850,000. I mean, this is 10 times, no, almost 20 times the circulation of the older magazines. The end of the 19th century also marked the birth of the best-selling novel. Of course, there had been best-selling novels before, like Uncle Tom's Cabin, but there hadn't been books publicized as bestsellers, as books that everyone needed to read the way people read John Grisham or Michael Crichton these days. It was a man named Frank Doubleday who came up with the idea of the bestseller. And the idea was you don't sell a book, you sell the author. You sell the author as a celebrity. And the first author who was sold in this way was a writer named Jack London. Jack London had a very adventurous life, you may know. He went to Alaska. He heard the call of the wild. And he could be sold to people, not just for his writing, but because he was a celebrity and you wanted to know about him. And in this way, you could promote all of his books. Because you weren't just promoting one novel, you were promoting a man. Uh, in this case, a best-selling star. At the same time, you get the first national advertising campaigns. In 1898, the country had its first million-dollar advertising campaign. A company called the National, N National Biscuit Company, we now call it Nabisco, 
spent a million dollars to convince people to buy Unida biscuits. And the way it sold Unida biscuits is they didn't get soft and soggy because they were packed in a watertight inner seal pouch. Uh, in other words, for the first time, Americans were convinced to buy a national brand and they're using trademarks and brand names and Blair to sell a product. Now who created these mass cultural elements? What's interesting is that they all came from the same profile. The creators of mass culture to a very disproportionate degree were first and foremost immigrants. They were outsiders. Many, maybe even a majority, were Jewish. So they were outsiders to white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America. And so they bring a somewhat different sensibility to American culture. These men had trained in journalism, in retail sales, and in entertainment. In other words, they knew how important the public taste was. These were people who believed that the public was right, not that they were right, and that you always have to respond to the public taste. And they also have a new sensibility. Victorian language was very florid. It was flowery. It was very expansive. These people don't like that. They like speech that's simple, direct, realistic, that sounds like real people talking. It's colloquial. They're in rebellion against the moralism of Victorian culture. They want life portrayed objectively, truthfully, without idealization, without avoiding the ugly. A writer named Frank Norris summed up this new philosophy of realism, as it's called. The task of the writer, he said, is to battle false views of life, false sentiments, false morality, false history, false philosophy, false emotions, false heroism. And this is a very new way of thinking, but one we take for granted. So now, one and a half classes into our course, it's time to start talking about the movies. And what we're going to do today is talk about the birth of the movies. We'll see how far we get. We're going to answer such questions as why did movies arise when they did? Why did they have such widespread popular appeal? Why did the United States come to dominate the movie industry? Why were Central and East European Jewish immigrants at the very forefront of this industry. And above all, a question that I want us all to ponder a bit, and that is, how can we appreciate silent movies? Most Americans think of silent movies as crude and primitive pioneers of what we have today, which is just more sophisticated and superior in every imaginable way. And yet I'm going to try to argue to you, and maybe even convince you, that silent films were an art form fundamentally different than the kind of movies that we are familiar with now. So let's now turn to the birth of the movies. The great goal of artists at the end of the 19th century was to reproduce motion. You've all heard of the Impressionist artists. And the whole point of Impressionist painting is not to portray a realistic but static world. 
but to give you a sense of a dynamic, changing, moving world. But an Impressionist painter can only do it on a two-dimensional canvas. So how can you truly portray motion? This was one of the real quests at the end of the 19th century. Earlier paintings gave no impression of movement. As I said, the Impressionist painters were trying to give a sense of dynamism. And all later art has striven to give a sense of movement on canvas. But inventors and scientists were convinced that there had to be some way to truly capture motion. The late 19th century was the great age of realism in fiction. It was the age of the machine. And so no wonder people were convinced that there would be a machine that could capture motion realistically. Now the problem was not a new one. Indeed, all the necessary inventions had been developed by 1640. So it took a long time to turn these abstract ideas into practical development. Indeed, the basic idea on which the movies depend was discovered in the second century AD. A philosopher named Ptolemy described a trick that our eyes play on us. He called this trick the persistence of vision. What Ptolemy described was this, that the eye receives an image and retains it in the retina for a tenth to a twentieth of a second. So our eyes all have a slight imperfection. And the great challenge facing scientists and inventors was how to take advantage of that imperfection. What you needed, everyone understood this, was a machine that could move a series of images before a projector, hold each image still for a fraction of a second, then move on to the next image, hold it still for a fraction of a second, go on to the next. Everyone knew what was necessary, and yet no one could figure out how you could do that. So the persistence of vision would fill the gap between one image and the next. Now by the year 1640, an early slide projector was developed. It was called the Magic Lantern. And you could take a series of drawings and put them in a Magic Lantern, and it would project the images on a screen. And if you could do this quickly, it sort of looked like things were moving. But you couldn't do it very quickly, and you couldn't produce very many of these slides. Uh, but it's not until the late 19th century that creating true motion pictures seems to become a possibility. Photography required the subject to remain utterly motionless for several moments to record an image on a glass plate. So if you were going to use cameras to record motion, you needed lots of cameras. And so in 1877, a man named Edward Mewbridge, and he actually spelled Edward the way it is on the screen, that's not a misspelling, lined up 24 cameras along the edge of a racetrack, and he had a horse run in front of them. As the horse ran, it would trip the shutters, and in that way he proved that as a horse gallops, all four hooves leave the ground simultaneously. But you're not going to line up cameras, right, in order to shoot movies. And in the late 1880s, shortly after he invented the phonograph, Thomas Edison decided that he would do for the eye 
what the phonograph had done for the ear. He would create moving pictures. Now, he announced that he would do this, but he wasn't that interested in doing it himself. And so he farmed the product project out to one of his lieutenants, a man named William Kennedy Dixon. And William Kennedy Dixon would be the American who would play a crucial role in developing motion picture technology. For nine years he would labor, but when he was done he had achieved movies in much of their present day form. He would invent the movie camera and he would invent a peep show device that would allow people to view moving pictures. Here's a, a picture of one of his devices. You can see how complicated it is. But by the time he was done, two brothers in France, the Lumiere brothers, had actually projected a movie to a paying audience. So it's a worldwide phenomena, at least a transatlantic phenomena, as people in a variety of countries, Germany, England, the United States, France, and elsewhere, are all experimenting, trying to come up with motion pictures. Now, three developments were necessary for the birth of the movies. The first is celluloid film. As long as you were using glass plates, you could never have moving pictures. You needed a flexible film. Now, Dixon would produce the first celluloid film, but later George Eastman would greatly improve it. Dixon would cut celluloid film uh, into one and a half inch strips. He perforated the edges so they could be drawn through a sprocket device behind the camera lens, and his camera would expose 48 frames every second. But Dixon couldn't figure out how to display films. He never was able to figure out how to project films to an audience. Uh, instead, he invented a very crude peep show device, the one that I just showed you. Viewers had to peer into a box with a magnifying glass, not a very successful form of mass entertainment. Thomas Edison was not impressed. He waited two years before he even bothered to patent Dixon's accomplishments, and when told that a European patent would cost him $250, he decided it wasn't worth it. And this would be the key to the success of the movies. A uh, mistake. He cared so little about the machine that it was five years before he set up a kinetoscope parlor, a peep show parlor, and a shoe store in New York City. He's just not that interested in this new technology. Now, Dixon had invented a peep show device. He now had to supply it with films. At first, he couldn't get the film to be strong enough to be longer than 15 seconds, because otherwise it would break or rip. Uh, and his first film showed a human sneeze. And the first films are what we call actualities. Actualities. They don't tell stories. Rather, they show scenes. And here, I think it's very difficult for us to appreciate this. We take storytelling in movies for granted. But people were so shocked to see motion that they didn't care if they told stories. They were just amazed to be able to see scenes that they had never been exposed to. They could see Buffalo Bill. They could see Annie Oakley. They could see Mary Queen of Scots. Uh, this seemed incredible to them. And so it would take quite a while before stories appear in moving pictures, replacing what were called actualities. Uh, even when the first films 
were shown, they were not created by movie makers. They were created by the exhibitors who would take different parts of films and put them together to tell a story. The movie makers hadn't figured that out yet. In the course of a single year, an Englishman, a German, and two French brothers succeeded in making moving projectors. But none of them would have been able to do what they had done if Thomas Edison had patented the technology. On March 22, 1895, the Lumiere brothers previewed the first genuine movies in our factory in Lyon, France. And then a year later, at the site of what's now Macy's in New York, Thomas Edison publicly presented his first show using his first projector. The key to making a film projector turned out to be incredibly simple in the end. Uh, can you think of any device that sort of works like a movie projector? that moves something forward, does something, then moves it forward again and does something, then moves something forward again. Can you think of any device that people use? The sewing machine. The sewing machine. It's when people discovered that you could take exactly the same technology and use it for film that you could make a film projector. It seems so obvious, but it took an awfully long time for people to figure that out. Uh, remarkable, I think. The newspapers reported that so enthusiastic was appreciation of the crowd long before the exhibition was finished that vociferous cheering was heard. So from the very start, the public was fascinated by this new technology. Edison had his cameramen record all kinds of scenes, including a papal mass at the Vatican and the head-on crash of two railroad engines he had purchased. Uh, Edison's distributors also introduced sex to the movies uh, by hiring two Broadway stars to kiss before the camera. Could we have the overhead projector? And there it is. Uh, people viewed this as somehow vaguely obscene. They had never seen anything quite like this in popular culture. But the trouble was a simple one. Edison, as should now be clear, did not think of movies as art or even as entertainment. He thought that the movies would be basically useful for business uh, purposes, or maybe educational purposes. But he had no interest at all in movies as entertainment. So it was now time for artists and showmen to enter the picture. And they would wage an epic struggle with Edison for control of the movie industry. Now the person who would transform the movies, who would churn the movies into the language of dreams, was a Frenchman named Georges Méliès. He was an inveterate inventor. He discovered either by accident or design all the basic camera tricks that movie makers use to tell a story. He used slow motion. He used stop motion, he used dissolves, he faded in, he faded out, he even used animation. The effect of all these tricks was to allow a movie maker to suggest the passage of time and to shift scenes from one place to another. In other words, he had to educate people to understand how movies tell stories, which is very different than the way novels tell stories. Screen time begins to shift from time as it normally passes in the real world in his movies. Movies could make believable shifts from time to time and place to place in a way that a legitimate theater could not. The one weakness in Melius's films is that he did not move the camera. It remained still it always remained in the middle distance, uh, and that would limit the kind of movies he could make. He was content to keep his camera in a single location and shoot each episode as if it was a scene from a play. And so real close-ups, real long shots, these were not part of his repertoire. The idea of moving the camera 
would be an American invention. Uh, from the start, however, Melius' movies charmed Americans. He wrote scripts, he used actors, he told complex stories. His 1902 film, A Trip to the Moon, was the greatest box office hit of its time. And because the films were silent, there were no language barriers. So it looks as if France will become the dominating force in movie making. And silent movies mean that there's no problem, right? You don't have to dub, you don't have to translate, it's easy to do. But Melius would end his days in poverty. He made movies, but unscrupulous operators would copy his movies and distributed them just the way the internet does today, right? Uh, and so while he was a great creative artist, great creative artists don't do so great uh, in the movie world. The person who would follow Melius's lead and who would also die in obscurity was Edwin Porter. Edwin Porter worked for Thomas Edison. He rummaged around in Edison's laboratory he found a great many bits of film dealing with fire and firemen. And with a fine sense of economy, he decided he'd put them together. He hired some actors to play a heroic fire chief and a mother and a child waiting to be rescued from the window of a burning building. Uh, when he was finished, he had made the first American film to tell a story, The Life of an American Fireman. By our standards, it doesn't tell much of a story, uh, and yet it is the beginning. He also used the first close-up and built his closing scene out of three intercut but separate shots. You have the firefighters arrive at the fire. You have the mother and children registering terror and the descent down the ladder to safety. Then the next year he made film history when he told a much more complex story when he made the great train robbery. Uh, as he set to work, newspapers had reported a rash of train robberies. He had a chance to move his camera outdoors and record a chase. The picture was crude. It remained at eye level and it was always at a distance but people loved it. The release of the great train robbery coincided with a business development that's absolutely crucial and that you need to know. And that is the development of the film exchanges. Film exchanges long before there was Blockbuster. If movie theaters had had to purchase every film, they wouldn't be able to purchase very many of them, would they? If they had to purchase films, this would use up all their money. But if some sort of middleman could purchase the films and then rent them out, then you could change films much more regularly. Uh, the scheme was simple. The exchange would buy the right to prints from the manufacturers and then it would rent the prints to the exhibitors. This would allow exhibitors to rapidly change their programs. The manufacturers were pleased to have middlemen market their pictures and this allowed the movie business to become a mass production industry. So you need business developments to make the movie industry function. At the same time, a strike by vaudeville performers created a sudden demand for motion picture equipment. Theater owners wanted to keep their houses open during the strike, and they showed movies instead of vaudeville shows. When the strike was over, then the movie projectors were bought by immigrants and their children who set up movie houses. Uh, the most famous of these movie houses was called the Nickelodeon. And if I have a picture, I will show it to you. Uh, excuse me. 
Uh, here's uh, one of the early Nickelodeons. Uh, it was called a Nickelodeon because it charged a five cent admission. And in its first week, with a five cent admission, it made a thousand dollars back when a thousand dollars was real money. By 1907, there were 100 film exchanges in 35 American cities. By 1908, there were 10,000 Nickelodeons. It was an incredibly rapid growth for an entirely new industry. What few had realized was that there was a new and untapped market for mass entertainment. The new immigrants unsure of themselves in a new country, coping with a strange language, wanted inexpensive outlets. They lived lives of oppressive poverty, and Nickelodeons would meet their needs. So from the very beginning, film was a form of mass entertainment directed toward the masses. Plain people needed no language to appreciate the silence, and they loved the movies. Now the middle class, the upper class, would direct crusades against the movies, but the marketplace would speak. Quick profits could be made, and so the industry could not be stopped. It could not be controlled. One small studio began with an investment of $600. Within three years, it was making $5,000 a week profit on two films a week. So before there were those internet startup companies uh, making instant uh, millionaires on Wall Street, there were these film companies doing the same thing. Many were eager to stop this entire industry. One establishment journal cried out, quote, a set of revolutionists training for the overthrow of government could find no surer means than these exhibitions. People looking for easy solutions to complex problems blame the movies just as they blame rap music today. Right? Juvenile delinquency, the restlessness of the lower classes, these could be blamed on the movies. So hundreds of cities and small towns passed ordinances requiring the licensing and prior censorship of all films. The last city uh, to get rid of that is a city very near here. Uh, Dallas was the last city in America to get rid of such a uh, censorship board, and it didn't get rid of it until a couple decades ago. Um, and it would not be until 1952 that the Supreme Court would finally extend free speech protections to the movies. The culmination of agitation occurred in 1915 when the Supreme Court declared that the First Amendment right to free speech does not apply to the movies. The court declared that the movies have nothing to do with intellect, they have nothing to do with the protections of the intellect, and therefore they could be regulated like any other kind of business. So just like vaudeville shows or carnivals, yes? What were the kinds of movies that were, um, that the Supreme Court reviewed in 1915 and 52? If you'll hold off, we'll show you uh, not, not clippings, but I'm going to show you some scenes from them. And you'll see why people were hot and bothered. Uh, assuming, I guess, I can show them on Channel 8. Well, uh, of course, behind many of these moral attacks on the movies were real issues of pure economic greed. The new Nickelodeons were competing successfully against saloons, vaudeville houses, even church collection plates. And those people were none too happy. There were any number of racy little items flashing across the screens. Bride retiring, kissing in a tunnel, ladies of the court bathing, college boys first love. The titles were racier than the movies, I'm afraid. Uh, 
But interestingly, most movies dealt with ordinary life. They dealt with the exploits of police officers and burglars, cowboys and factory workers, farmers and country girls, clerks and politicians, drunks and servant girls, and the like. Then, as now, people wanted to see real life reflected on the screen. Sure, they'll watch a few historical movies, but mainly they want to see their lives or a richer, fuller, more exciting version of their lives on the screen. Now, the early film business was extraordinary. I guess it's sort of like the internet today. There were no rules. A common practice was to steal another movie maker's picture. You would rent it from an exchange. You'd make a copy of it. You put your own trademark on it, and then you'd rent it out to somebody else. Brilliant. Uh, another ploy was to rent a film in the name of one theater, then copy it and distribute it in lots of theaters. Thomas Edison was not happy. After all, he may not have cared much about the movies, but he did control the American patents. Uh, he had the patents on the movie making process, just as Time Warner controls the copyrights of much music these days. Uh, few movie houses or makers bothered to pay him any royalties. By 1907, it was clear the Nickelodeons were here to stay. So Edison decided to take his competitors to court. So fast was the rate of growth that Edison feared he would never be able to break them all. And so in traditional big business fashion, he decided to form a trust. He would unite his company with his major competitors, like AOL and Time Warner, and he would then go after the little guys. The new trust was called the Motion Picture Patents Company. It decreed that only member firms had the right to make, print, and distribute films and film equipment. If you refused to use Edison's equipment, then you couldn't rent any movies. Should you fail to use the trust's films, then you couldn't use the equipment. And each exhibitor would have to pay the trust a tax of $2 a week. The exhibitors quickly fought back. They were led by a man named William Fox, 20th Century Fox, and Carl Lemley of Universal Pictures. The trust would slap literally hundreds of lawsuits against them. Uh, the stage was now set for an epic struggle to control an industry that had greater potential for wealth than anyone ever imagined. This is really, I think, the historical precedent for what's going on right now uh, with the internet and the issue of copyright protection on the internet. On one side was the trust. It rented movies by the foot, 10 cents a foot. They literally viewed movies like sausages. You would turn them out, as many as you could, and rent them. On the other side, were the independent producers and exhibitors equally convinced that longer films that told stories were the key to success. Out of this revolution came a new film industry. It would be located in Hollywood, and it would dominate the movie industry for the next three decades, 20s, 30s, and the 40s. It would be the studio system created by the independents who had challenged Edison's trust. Three events would lead to the triumph of the independents, and I suspect I'll only be able to mention two of them now. The first was the establishment of Hollywood as a production center. The second was the rise of the star system. And the third was the emergence of the feature film, and especially the director, D.W. Griffith. The rise of Hollywood's easy to explain. If you're sued 
What's the best way to respond to a lawsuit? Be in a different state. Okay. The filmmakers thought long and hard about where they could be. You don't make movies in New York if you're going to be sued in New York. So they tried a variety of places. They tried to move to Cuba, uh, but the disease was too bad. They tried Florida, but that was too hot. They went to San Francisco, but that seemed a little far from the Mexican border, just in case they had to leave quickly. And what seemed ideal was Los Angeles. It had an abundance of barns that you could convert into studios. It had landladies who were willing to uh, allow disreputable uh, theatrical types to rent. The climate was pick perfect for picture making. There was a bright, steady sun. Uh, it seemed like Italy, they said. Uh, in addition, there was an abundance of cheap labor. And nearby, there was a wide variety of beautiful scenery for location work. In addition, and most importantly, distance freed the production people from the interference of the courts and the business people. Indeed, much of the history of the film industry is the struggle between New York, which nominally owns the industry, and the people in Hollywood who are a continent away and are impossible to truly control. Okay, so the first thing that would break the trust would be the movement of the independents across the continent to Hollywood. Let's stop there and we'll go on next class.